Uh, uh, um, point of information, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Um, I'm flabbergasted that we are starting the meeting when we just had voted. Um, this is unprecedented. Uh, we just finished a vote in the House of Commons here, and we start a committee meeting moments after. We don't even have time to walk to the committee room. How well, did this happen? Well, we did have a quorum, and it was the will of the committee members who were here to get started, given the uh, time. But this has never process. happened before. This has never happened before. Point, point well taken. How, how did? I, I, I'd like to. I mean, I'm going to channel in my inner garnet. I, I just yeah, hope that this will never happen again. Is I hope the vice chair is there, Mr. Mr. Janis. What, what is he? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to channel my inner garnet, and I'm just asking if this doesn't happen again. Point well thank taken. You. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zaberi. Uh, now we will uh, proceed with our uh, second witness, uh, Mr. Tarachin. Uh, you have five minutes for your opening remarks. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, honorable members of the committee for inviting me to testify before this esteemed uh, committee. I would like to use this opportunity to speak on the arbitrary detention, torture and killings in Tibet. Uh, and I would like to start by sharing the stories of some Tibetans who were uh, detained, tortured, killed in recent years. In July 2022, a 56-year-old Tibetan monk Jigme Gyatso died after a prolonged illness, uh, multiple organ failure caused by uh, the torture and the inhuman treatment he endured in the prison. He was detained several times uh, over the period of 15 years. The first time he was detained was in 2006 when he returned to Tibet after attending the teachings of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in India. He was detained for the second time in 2008 uh, around the time when there was protests in Tibet during the uh, 2008 Beijing Olympic. He was, uh, when he was detained in this, for the second time, he was waiting nearby his monastery to repair his shoes. <clears throat> Although he had not taken part in the 2008 uh, Beijing Olympic protest, uh, he was still detained based on his uh, past history of being detained. After his release, uh, Jigme created a video testimony providing a first-hand account of the torture he endured. In the video, Jigme reveals what he had told the Chinese police forces before his release. Quote, if you kill me, then <clears throat> that will be the end of it. But if I'm able to leave and get the opportunity, I will speak about the torture I endured. I will bear witness as a truthful voice to the suffering of my friends and report these events to the media. Uh, unquote. Likewise, in February 2021, a Tibetan tour guide named Kunchuk Jimpa died in a hospital uh, three months after being transferred from uh, prison without the knowledge of his family. He was serving a 21-year-old prison sentence for sharing information to the outside world, for, to the foreign media, about a local environmental protest. The local sources said that he had brain hemorrhage and body paralysis. In the same year, a 19-year-old Tibetan monk, Tenzin Nyima, died after being released from prison in a comatose state. Tenzin was arrested along with four other monks for their peaceful demonstration nearby the local police authorities demanding the Tibetan uh, independence. He was released uh, in 2020 but was rearrested the same year for allegedly sharing the news of his arrest to Tibetans in exile. In 2020, a 36 year old mother, Lamo, died shortly after being transferred to, again, being transferred to hospital from police custody. She was detained on the charges of sending money to the, her family in exile in India. Her body was immediately cremated, preventing any further investigation on her case. Mr. Chair, there are many other Tibetan prisoners who died in prison or shortly after being released or uh, transferred from prison. 
they were not terrorists, they were not separatists, no dangers to the state security as China accused them to be. They were mothers, they were entrepreneurs, they were tour guides, they were monks, they were singers who had dreams about living a dignified life as Tibetan in their own lands. Mr. Chair, what binds this story together is how they didn't have access to lawyers, how they didn't have access to their family while being detained, and how none of them had an opportunity for a fair trial, how they were tortured and discriminated just because they were Tibetans, and how none of their cases so far have been investigated, and none of their perpetrators are being held accountable. As indicated in Jigme Gyatso, the 56-year-old monk uh, video testimony, they expected those of us in exile, those of us living in a free democratic countries like Canada, to raise the challenges to talk about issues that they faced. They risked their lives in passing information to the outside world so that we would know about the reality of situation in Tibet, so that we would know about over 1 million Tibetan nomads being forcibly relocated, so that we would know about over 1 million Tibetan children forced into boarding school for political indoctrination, so that we would know about the destructions of Tibetan monasteries such as Larungar and Yarchengar, and so that we would know about the evictions of Tibetan monks and nuns, and so that those of us in exile, those of us in a free world, world would know about the cultural genocide that is taking place in Tibet through the destructions of their language, religion, and cultural identity. Mr. Chair, the situation in Tibet under President Xi Jinping is dire and urgent. I request this committee to consider using tools we have at our disposal, such as Sergei Magnitsky Act uh, and this bill to uh, C-281, to challenge and counter such blatant human rights violation. We cannot and must not let the perpetrators to continue any more of such crimes with impunity. Thank you. Um, certainly a difficult testimony, but we're very, very grateful for that. Uh, now for our uh, final witness, we will go to uh, uh, Ms. Lung. Uh, Ms. Lung, you have uh, five minutes as well. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Catherine Lung, and I'm the policy advisor for Hong Kong Watch in Canada. Hong Kong Watch supports the heart of Bill C-281, which would make it easier for parliamentarians to recommend foreign officials who should be included on a sanctions list, including those guilty for the ongoing human rights crackdown in Hong Kong. As committee members will no doubt be aware, many of these Hong Kong officials have links to Canada, including owning property, having family members with foreign passports, and having been educated here. The bill would also rightly increase the government's powers to ban state propaganda outfits operating in Canada, like CGTN, who spread disinformation and seek to interfere in our public debates. Such a ban would bring Canada in line with like-minded partners like the UK, which banned CGTN in February 2021. The specific amendment to the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development Act is a welcome provision. As I'm sure members are aware, Hong Kong has over 1,000 political prisoners at this time, and this number is only growing. We note that there are several political prisoners who previously held Canadian citizenship or who have family links to Canada. The Hong Kong authorities have jailed so many political prisoners in the last several years that overcrowding in prisons is a growing problem as the authorities are running out of space to put the activists, journalists, and trade unionists that they have incarcerated. Hong Kong has one of the largest growing populations of political prisoners in the world. With over 10,000 politically related arrests since 2019, we urge global affairs to consider better tools to track and identify those prisoners of conscience who have links to Canada. We believe this new provision will allow NGOs like Hong Kong Watch to be better equipped to advocate for the release of people whose only crime is to fight for the betterment of their country. Regarding the provision on the Magnitsky Act, we should be proud to be one of the first countries in the world to adopt the Magnitsky sanctions regime, which allows us to target and hold to account individual human rights violators. It is therefore sad to note that not a single entity or individual from China has currently been sanctioned by Canada under the Magnitsky Act. As members will be aware, Canada has sanctioned just four individuals and one entity in China for human rights violations in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region under the Special Economics Measures Act. We have no shortage of reasons to sanction Chinese and Hong Kong officials. 
In fact, parliamentarians have repeatedly called on the government to do so in the form of letters and committee reports. Sanctions are a tool for Canada to hold human rights violators accountable. Tools only work when they're used. From what we have seen, there's an inconsistency in the government's approach. It has introduced a Magnitsky sanctions regime, which it claims is world leading, yet it refuses to use it, instead relying on SEMA. The sole purpose of the Magnitsky Act is to protect human rights on a global scale, whereas SEMA exists as an economic sanction scheme and is not intended to be used solely against human rights violations. The proposal of this bill to create a mechanism by which the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs is required to respond to recommendations made by a parliamentary committee is a welcome step forward. This will serve as a way to not only incentivize the government to utilize this tool for its intended purpose, but will also provide transparency on the reasons behind such decisions. After all, sanctions do not sit in a vacuum from wider policymaking. They are political in nature and have a significant impact on the bilateral relations between countries. The decision and reasoning not to sanction an individual human rights violator is as important as the rationale for doing so. This provision of the bill will help inform the public, civil society groups, and NGOs on the wider thinking when it comes to the government's sanction policy and its commitments to uphold human rights. Turning to the amendment to the Broadcasting Act, I believe Canadians would find it reasonable that regimes that are committing genocide or ongoing human rights violations should not be given a platform on Canadian airwaves. The distribution of state propaganda from countries that grossly violate human rights is not in the public interest. For example, CGTN is under the control of the Central Propaganda Department of the Chinese Communist Party, it is a tool of propaganda, disinformation, and the violation of human rights. In 2019, CGTN aired a forced confession video of Hong Kong activist Simon Cheng recorded under duress, which he was coerced into filming as a condition for his release. CGTN has also broadcast a blatant disinformation, such as the denial of the Uyghur genocide, mischaracterizing the Hong Kong pro-democracy movement as riots rather than peaceful protests, and claiming that COVID-19 originated in the U.S. in contradiction to scientific evidence. An important point to raise is who is on the receiving end of this propaganda. In Canada, it is largely Chinese immigrant communities that are consuming this. To allow CGTN to continue operating on public state-owned Canadian airwaves is to allow Beijing's propaganda to misinform, propagandize, and have direct influence on Chinese-speaking Canadians. In closing, we are supportive of Bill C-281 as a way to increase government accountability and transparency in Canada's role in upholding human rights internationally. Thank you. Thank you uh, very of, much, Ms. Lung. Point of, uh, personal now, privilege, uh, point of personal privilege. Yes, Mr. Zuberi. Um, so I'd just like to note for the record, if I did not have my computer today and my phone, I would not have been able to participate in this committee meeting. The only reason why I'm able to participate in this meeting right now is because I have my laptop. My phone is actually in the shop and I cannot vote remotely. So it would have been physically impossible for me if somebody don't message me on my personal cell to tell me that this committee had started for me to participate as a member of this committee to be in this meeting. This meeting should not have started 10, within 10 minutes after we had completed the vote count. Uh, Mr. Zuberi, again, uh, as I indicated earlier. And the, the, the Conservatives have filibustered for seven meetings. This will be heard. Mr. Zuberi, again. I, I, yes. I implore that this does not happen ever again. It would not be physically Mr. possible. Mr. Zuberi, your member. point is well taken, uh, as was indicated. Uh, this has happened previously as well when uh, we have a, a tight schedule. If there is a quorum, the members can say, can we resume? The Conservative Party has not respected this committee. It has filibustered this committee for seven meetings. And that the, the, our witnesses in this committee have been sidelined, have been disrespected by the Conservative Party. And this is a matter of parliamentary privilege, the way how this organization functions. We cannot even have witnesses if this organization doesn't function properly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Zuberi. Now we will uh, proceed with uh, questions to... Uh, Chair, just, just on, the, on, the, on the question yes, of privilege, Mr. if Jackson. I can comment on it. Um, I, I'm not sure what this has to do with the Conservative Party. The member has raised a, a question of privilege, and it's the prerogative the, the, this, of the chair to This rule has on everything it. to do with you personally and the Conservative Party. You have filibustered this committee for but seven meetings in the past. The, this has everything you, to do you, with you. You're, personally. you're raising a question. The, the member raised a question of privilege, and the chair can rule on that question of privilege, or he can reserve judgment for later. Uh, but I'm I'm not the chair. 
just to be to be clear i'm not the but chair. you have filibustered this meeting for seven meetings in the past it's been documented that's, that's, reported that's just upon. not that's not what we're talking about today that's a fact it's not the question of privilege you raised anyways i'm done thank you the question of the issue of privilege is that this committee should not have happened in any way whatsoever from from the point that i personally could physically walk from the house of commons vote and get to this committee meeting this meeting Again, should Mr. not have Zuberi, happened. Thank you. Not have started. I should, now, I given the, thank you. the limited time we have available uh, for questions from the witnesses, uh, we will proceed with uh, questions. Um, I should advise all the members uh, that regrettably uh, Mr. Turp uh, had to leave us uh, due to a previous engagement. Uh, so he's no longer uh, connected. Uh, so uh, we can now proceed with questions for the two witnesses that remain, uh, which is Mr. Turchin from the Canada Tibet Committee. Uh, and Ms. Catherine Long from the uh, Hong Kong Watch. So uh, the first question goes to uh, MP Lawrence. Uh, you have four minutes. Thank you very much. Um, just uh, for the uh, chair, uh, I'll be splitting my time with Mr. Jenis. Um, I'll be uh, just asking a couple of questions of you, Mr. Tereshin, and thank you very much for your testimony. It was very moving and powerful, and I can certainly say for myself, and I'm sure there are many other rooms that we stand with Tibet. Um, the, um, just with respect to uh, the first two uh, parts of the uh, C-281, the first one, uh, the first area is uh, prisoners of conscience. So just in general, maybe not getting the specifics of the legislation, but do you believe that by shining more lights of some of the atrocities that are being uh, happening against uh, and prisoners of conscience being held uh, by uh, by the regime in Beijing. Um, do you believe that that could be helpful uh, to uh, to prisoners of conscience uh, um, who are human rights uh, defenders from Tibet? Oh, thank you for the question. It would certainly the reason I chose to talk about this particular topic of arbitrary detention, torture, and killing is because I find that this particular topic connects many other human rights violations. Uh, and Tibet issue is very complex uh, and very really, uh, multi-layered. Uh, we have uh, religious, uh, lack of religious freedom. Uh, there, there are protests related to uh, lack of uh, opportunity to practice and promote Tibetan language. Uh, there are Tibetan nomads being, you know, displaced. There are ch uh, Tibetan children being forced into uh, boarding schools. But what connects all of this is there are any Tibetans uh, found protesting, raising their voice against any of these human rights violations are put immediately without any formal charges into uh, the prison. And the, and the trouble, the trauma, the torture that they go through have created an environment of fear among Tibetans in Tibet that deter many other Tibetans to participate in uh, similar protests in future. And a good example is in 2008 Beijing Olympic, we saw protests across Tibet. And the purge on those who participated in 2008 Beijing Olympic continues till today. And hence, it's not surprised that we didn't see much protests in the uh, last year Winter Olympic that happened in Beijing. Thank you very much. Rest my time over to Mr. Jenis. Thank you to our uh, our excellent witnesses today, um, and uh, apologies for the time. The, th the things beyond our control. Um, Ms. Liang, you alluded to the fact that foreign state controlled media is a form of foreign interference. Uh, I wonder if you can develop that idea a little bit and and explain your thoughts on that. Thank you, Mr. Jenis. Um, it has been spoken about explicitly by Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang that um, overseas Chinese is a is a tool that they wish to use in in exerting Chinese influence abroad. Um, the the way that this becomes interference instead of simple influence is that these these overseas Chinese populations are fed misinformation, disinformation and propaganda directly through CGTN on Canadian airwaves. Um, I should note that it is primarily um, Chinese diaspora populations that are consuming um, this information and and therefore they are the tools that are used by the United Front Work Department to spread, um, if they take it as truth, to spread the disinformation to people who don't watch CGTN. It is, it is also important to note that um, it has been stated in the United Front Work Department's mandate that 
they they explicitly will guide the the Chinese populations abroad. That is one of their objectives. Thank you. Uh, we next go to uh, MP Zuberi. MP Zuberi, you have four minutes. We can't hear you, Mr. Zuberi. I'd like to thank the witnesses uh, for being here and share that um, that I have a lot of empathy and um, and um, awareness of your causes, uh, for your causes, and I thank you for being here in person and uh, remotely today uh, to testify. I'd also like to note um, that the subcommittee of this committee, the Foreign Affairs Committee, is um, looking at um, a study uh, relating to uh, residential schools in Tibet, um, and I just ask you to look out for that in terms of the testimony that we're having there uh, and, and um, what the committee will do from that um, study. Um, I'd like to, I'd like to ask, um, I'd like to learn more about uh, the situation in Tibet and to hear about what, what the views are with respect to, um, how Tibetans are treated. And in, is it the case that in all situations that, that those who are receiving repression from the state that their cases should always be put in public or sometimes do we need to advocate in private for them? That's directed towards um, yes. uh, Mr. Terchin, yes. veteran, sorry, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you for the question. The, it would always help to make uh, the challenges faced by Tibetans public because one of the challenges we deal uh, concerning Tibet is the lack of information coming out of Tibet. Tibet remains one of the most inaccessible region uh, in the entire uh, world. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, Tibetan risk their life uh, sharing their information, passing their information to their families in exile so that it would reach out to the outside world so that we, we, we could talk about it in platforms like this. So it would mm -hmm. certainly help to um, talk about the issues uh, publicly. And I also wanted to add that uh, the Dharamsala-based think tank, Tibetan Center for Human Rights and Development, they have a database of over 2,000 Tibetan being detained in Tibet. And many of them serve prison sentence from 10 to 15 years for uh, charges as uh, frivolous, I find, as a passing information, or talking to your family members in exile, or sending money in case of 36-year-old mother uh, to your family members who is in exile. There's nothing political about their activities, and yet uh, they are detained, tortured, in, and in some cases uh, killed in prison or after uh, the release from the prison. Hmm. So pick up on that point around um, getting information out of Tibet. Can you, and, and outside of this legislation, can you talk about other items that you think uh, might be might be helpful in order to get more information out from Tibet that relates to specific legislation or otherwise? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, in addition to visits to Tibet, uh, that happened in, in uh, I believe, in 2020 with the uh, Ambassador Dominic Burton. I hope, you know, something like uh, reciprocal access to Tibet, an act that was passed in the US uh, about two years ago, could really help uh, here in Canada. The principle of reciprocity could be applied. Uh, we had Chinese appointed delegates from the so-called Tibetan Autonomous Region testifying before this very committee in 2018. And yet, uh, we don't get the same opportunity for our uh, parliamentarians, Canadian parliamentarians, to go uh, independently without any restriction in any parts of the world. So uh, unrestricted, independent visits by Canadian of government officials, Canadian uh, uh, parliamentarians, Canadian media to Tibet would certainly help to gather more information about what's happening there. Thank you, Mr. Thurchin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now uh, go to Ms. Normandin, who's, uh, you have four minutes. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. 
Thank you, and th thank you uh, to the two witnesses. For you, Mrs. Long, we've heard comments saying that if the recommendations on the Magnitsky Act recourse go through a recommendation made by the committee to the minister, it is a risk uh, that we might send out our intention to people who might um, withdraw their assets from the country, and there, there, there's a risk uh, in imposing sanctions. I'd like to hear you speak to this, and perhaps a comment on is it is this risk balanced out by the uh, possibility of having more recourse to Magnitsky if it comes from the committee? Thank you for the question. I believe that there's there's always the risk of um, foreign foreign um, officials wanting to move their assets. But what we do know right now is that foreign officials from China and from Hong Kong do store their assets overseas because of the the likelihood that um, Xi Jinping will do another corruption crackdown. So there are many, many officials in Hong Kong in particular who have foreign assets and they're usually under the name of a family member so that they wouldn't be traced when there is a corruption crackdown. Um, it, is, it is for historical reasons that they do this because of Hong Kong's previous colonial history. But um, with that said, it is important that we do publish the list of names um, for individuals that we should sanction in Canada because it is the leverage that Canada has over human rights violators in Hong Kong and China. Um, like Russian oligarchs, they like to store their wealth abroad because of the unstable economy in their country. And as Western countries, this is the leverage we have to hold them to account. And I believe that um, that in itself counterbalances the risk of them moving assets. Merci beaucoup. Une... Thank you. A question for both witnesses on the idea of having a list naming uh, prisoners of conscience. Would it be a good idea to have an explanation? Not just the name, but also an explanation as to why they are prisoners of conscience. Perhaps to use this as a, as a teaching tool for the population. Oh, thank you. It would certainly help to um, for us, you know, that, that, that's the goal that to share information about uh, the prisoner of conscience. As I mentioned earlier, um, there are official records of over 2000 Tibetan political prisoners. And uh, there are you know, details about why they were detained. What were the charges in, in case there were charges and what were uh, the prison sentences uh, and details about as Jigme Gyatso testified details about the torture that they went through which I hope would be very helpful to the committee members. And I'm, I'm happy to submit those reports. Madam Long? And if I may add to it, um, I do believe it is a good idea to publish um, the rationale behind it. I, I Especially in Hong Kong, there are many um, political prisoners who have been charged under what may, may seem as legitimate charges in countries with the rule of law. So for example, we have a lot of protesters who were charged with um, possession of a dangerous weapon when they were only carrying, for example, an umbrella or a flashlight. Um, these are widely, widely known cases in Hong Kong, and there are many of them. Um, so I think it would be good for for there to be a rationale, because to the, to the unassuming um, person, it might seem like they actually did something that um, constitutes a crime when really it is a political charge. Merci. Go to uh, Ms. McPherson for four minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to both of the witnesses for being here today and sharing your testimony with us. I think it's it's so important for us to hear this, and, and I also sit on the International Human Rights Subcommittee, so I have heard some testimony um, regarding the residential schools in Tibet and, and um, yeah, thank you for being here. I'm going to ask uh, the same questions. I'm going to ask two questions, and I'll give you some time to, to respond if that's all right. With regards to Bill C-281, the New Democratic Party is bringing forward a number of, of different um, amendments, but one of the amendments that we'd like to see is with regards to a human rights strategy. So Canada does not have a, a human rights strategy that we could use as a baseline uh, for the annual report. So what we're pushing for is that we would have that baseline so that that, that the government could could um, show what they've achieved you know, using that as the baseline. So I'd like some information on you and whether or not you would agree that a human rights strategy would be useful in this in this legislation. The other piece that I'd like to just ask you about very quickly, 
uh, in this legislation, we have a definition of a prisoner of conscience. Now, Alex Neve, the Secretary General of the of Amnesty International, joined us yes or last meeting, and he suggested that instead of it be prisoner of conscience, we should have a definition that says individuals who are detained or experiencing other treatment in contravention of international human rights standards. Would you agree that that would be useful to have within this legislation and, and perhaps expand on it? And perhaps I'll start with you, Mr. Thurgeon. Uh, it would certainly be helpful to, uh, and I agree on the amendment of human rights strategies uh, on the bill C-281. And uh, although I'm not really familiar with the technicalities, but I would certainly defer to Alex Neve, who I've known for many years as a very well-respected uh, human rights defenders, uh, supporters on uh, to all the uh, victims of Ch uh, Chinese oppression, whether it's Tibetans, Uyghurs, Hong Kongers. Uh, so in this case, uh, I would agree with what Alex Neve has uh, recommended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it gives more um, breadth to pr what, what he what he brought up is the idea that there are people that have been detained or there are there are people that we don't actually know whether they've been detained. Um, but but would also want to have protection under some of this legislation. Uh, Ms. Long, could you provide your thoughts? Yes. Um, yes. Both both amendments would be agreeable to me. I don't see why there cannot be um, a human rights strategy from the government. We have seen a lot of different um, um, statements of concern and mandate letters, et cetera, from the government without a solid um, human rights strategy. So that I think would be helpful, especially for NGOs um, like Hong Kong Watch who are advocating for human rights. Um, and as for the amendment for the definition of prisoner of conscience, I believe that would be helpful. And um, it, it would definitely add more clarity to, to how the bill was to be applied. And one last question for you, Ms. Long. I just want to get a little bit more information from you with regards to the use of, of um, SEMA versus the Magnitsky sanctions. Can you tell me what the difference in your opinion is in terms of outcome, not in terms of the application, but in terms of outcome? In terms of outcome, it is, it is difficult to tell currently because we don't really have enough cases to compare them in my opinion. Um, we have seen a lot of sanctions under SEMA, but really not, not that many under the Magnitsky Act. So it's, I think it's difficult to tell at this moment. That's all my questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, McPherson. Uh, we now go uh, to the second round of questioning. Uh, for this round, each member will be provided uh, two minutes with the exception of, uh, of the block and the NDP, which we'll get in a minute each. Uh, so we first go to Mr. Jenis. You have two minutes, sir. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. And I think we've heard good testimony from witnesses that will inform us on potential amendments, especially around the section on how to how to get the balance right uh, on um, on the prisoners of conscience issue. In the one hand, I think there is a need to have some external pressure to the government on the government. And generally, there is a benefit to more um, more exposure to these cases. Uh, but there may be there may be exceptions and we we should be cognizant of those exceptions as well. Um, so, um, but maybe just in the limited time I had left, I did want to ask Mr. Uh, Thurchin if you could um, share if you think the Tibet community is impacted by foreign interference here by CGTN or through other other mechanisms. Uh, does the repression extend to the Tibetan diaspora? Uh, thank you for the question. The PRC repression of Tibetans certainly extend to Tibetan outside of Tibet to Tibetans in India, to Tibetans in Nepal, and to Tibetans in Canada, uh, US, and elsewhere. Um, we have seen Tibetans, one of the ways that Tibetans in exile are targeted is, the, is whether they have still families in Tibet or not. And that seemed to make a difference in, in preventing them in participating any political activity uh, something as simple as participating in our annual Tibetan Uprising Day, which happens to be on March 10. And you would see that Tibetans from all walks of life, from different ages, take this day once, once a year very seriously to remember the massacre of thousands of Tibetans that were killed in 1959. And yet, there's a fear prevalent among many Tibetans, who, especially those who have families in Tibet. And so you would not see them participating in events like this. 
there are Tibetans, uh, especially the human rights defenders, uh, who have be uh, become victims, as uh, the Freedom House reported in September last year, that Tibetans exile uh, members of the Tibetan diaspora have faced relentless phishing and hacking attacks, as well as intimidation and threats online. On a more uh, larger scale, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Turchin. Uh, we now go to uh, the next member, uh, Madame Bendayan. You have two minutes. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Et dans... Thank you. First of all, even if Professor Turp is not there, I would like to highlight the importance of his testimony and the fact that it's also an honor to have a professor from University of Montreal uh, in my writing uh, to uh, testify before the committee. If Professor Turp could provide um, to the committee more information with regards to other terms that might exist elsewhere in the um, law, either in Canada or elsewhere, and that could be used uh, here, we might be uh, looking for terms that are already have a legal definition. As we have witnesses here um, before us today, uh, take the rest of my time to to ask you um, to elaborate a little bit in terms of your own personal experience um, uh, with uh, Tibetan prisoners. If you feel um, that having a list um, may be prejudicial, for example, for uh, for those individuals that don't make it onto the list, um, what message would we be sending um, to them? Well, that, that's, I believe, uh, a difficult choice. Uh, but it's, it's a case that is quite common in Tibet where the list of uh, people who are detained uh, do not get public. And the number that I mentioned earlier, 2000, uh, I would say is a very small fraction of overall numbers. And there, are, uh, I would guess there are a thousand more Tibetans who are detained, and yet we do not know of the, uh, of the identity of the rationale behind their arrest. Um, so whether we should you know, make the list uh, public or not, I would uh, recommend that the list uh, become public so that at least we know stories. Because the problem, as I mentioned earlier, the challenge is that we do not know enough about the stories coming out of Tibet. Is there any risk to the prisoners that um, would be listed? Do you um, do you have any uh, fear or concern that they could uh, face worse conditions um, as a result of being on the list? There's certainly a risk, uh, but as uh, indicated in the testimony from the uh, Jigme Gyatso who passed away last year, they are taking this decision because they hope that people would know about it. Madame Normandin, uh, you have a minute. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. I would like to ask a similar question to both witnesses. I'll ask it to Mrs. Long. The use of a list, could it be, uh, could it represent a prejudice to some um, pre prisoners? Could we um, not, not publish the names of those who don't want their names on a list? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I believe that it would be um, good for the government to consult with the families of the detained before publishing the list. Um, we have heard from some Hong Kongers that they would rather not have their names be public, um, especially family members who, who may be living in Canada um, would, would also say the same thing because um, the treatment of political prisoners in Hong Kong is very, um, very bad, to say it bluntly. Um, but that should not deter the government from publishing a list in general. Um, I believe that it would be good for the government to put pressure on, on the, the Chinese government when they are detaining um, political prisoners. And it would be important that we do publish that list to put pressure on them to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, so that now means uh, that we will uh, move to the next panel. Uh, before oh, we do I, so, uh, get my last minute. Oh, my apologies, Miss McPherson. You're absolutely right. Yes, you do get a minute. My apologies. 
It's not very much time, but I certainly would still appreciate getting it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you again to our witnesses. I, I think because my colleague from the block uh, asked that that question of, of our colleague online, I would ask the, a very similar question. Is Do you see a way that we could provide a list that would be both public and private based on the circumstances so that there would be some protection for those who do not want to make their name private and and a, a way of, of saying, who and you know how many, but without re revealing identities, would that be a would that be a solution that you could see from your perspective? Certainly, yes. but the list we have is already public. Uh, but those uh, list, uh, those people who are detained and who do not want to be identified, sure. But our list is already public and. Mm -hmm. And I think when we look at legislation, it's important to recognize that this legislation will apply to the entire uh, globe. So in some circumstances, of course, it would probably be uh, be, be something that those who are detained would not want public. I agree. Yeah. Thank you very much. And with that, Mr. Chair. Thank you, you uh, very much for that. Uh, so at this point, uh, just wanted to uh, thank uh, Mr. Turchin and Ms. Long. Uh, for your uh, invaluable testimony and your perspective. Uh, we will certainly uh, make uh, very good use of uh, all the things that you did bring to our uh, attention. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, we will move to uh, the second panel now. Uh, we will just suspend for a couple of minutes, no more, and then uh, resume. Um, and, and for all those members who are online, uh, you don't have to do anything but uh, we're just gonna check in with the next set of uh, witnesses. Thank you. <laughs>
Welcome uh, back, everyone. Uh, we will now resume our consideration of uh, Bill C-281, uh, as was agreed by uh, the members. Uh, this panel we will hear from until uh, 1.15. Um, uh, we have uh, three great panelists with us uh, here today. Uh, first, uh, we have Mr. Earl Turcott, uh, who is uh, appearing as an individual. Uh, second, uh, we have Mr. Uh, uh, William Browder, who is the founder and chief executive officer and head of the Global Magnitsky Justice Campaign. Uh, he is here uh, on behalf of Hermitage uh, Capital uh, Management. Uh, and uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we have Ms. Uh, Farida uh, Dyfe, who's here from Human Rights Watch Canada. Um, so, so we're looking very much forward to your testimony. Uh, if I may, uh, please only speak when you're recognized uh, by the chair. Uh, we will go with uh, Mr. Uh, Turcott first uh, for your opening remarks uh, for uh, five minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair and uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll restrict my colleague, uh, my comments rather, to the uh, the only area of Bill C-281 with which I am competent to speak, and that is regarding cluster munitions. Um, First, I'd like to congratulate Mr. Lawrence and parliamentary colleagues who uh, worked with him to develop these proposed amendments. Uh, certainly with respect to cluster munitions, what it would do is to make explicit in Canada's law what some would maintain is implicit in the prohibition on assistance in the development uh, use or in any other way advancing the use of cluster munitions. I will, uh, as you'll see very soon, uh, be recommending that uh, amendments go further uh, than this provision, however. Uh, just very quickly, uh, for those who may not be uh, that familiar with cluster munitions, uh, they were first developed in World War II, used uh, most extensively in the carpet bombing campaigns in Southeast Asia and the Vietnam War, and more recently in Afghanistan, uh, Yemen, Syria, and as I'm sure most of you know, very extensively now in Ukraine, mostly by Russia, uh, but there have been reports in a few instances by Ukrainian troops themselves. Um, these are the polar opposite of a precision weapon. They have been described as conventional weapons of mass destruction. Um, they are by design uh, area-wide uh, area wide weapons. Uh, that is to say, what happens is a, when a cluster bomb is dropped, either ground launch or airdropped, um, think of it as a large hollow casing within which there are typically hundreds of submunitions, extremely deadly submunitions, uh, far deadlier actually than landmines on average. Um, one cluster bomb can cover the area roughly of three football fields. Uh, and uh, there are uh, being used in uh, by Russia today, multiple launch rocket systems that can launch 12 bombs or, or, or rocket rounds in succession, very quick succession, and uh, and many, many of them. So essentially, uh, it's a weapon that saturates a given area and makes no distinction, of course, between combatants and non-combatants, especially when deliberately used in civilian areas, as, as it appears to be in the case of Ukraine. Um, it was because of the humanitarian impact on civilians primarily, and according to the International Committee of the Red Cross and uh, civil society experts, roughly 97% of all known victims worldwide have been civilians, and within that, 66% children who are often drawn to the bright colors of the submunitions, and many maintain that they've been designed that way quite intentionally. It was uh, no mistake then that the international community uh, in the uh, mid 2000s uh, decided that cluster munitions had to be banned as the world had already banned, or most of the world had already banned anti-personal landmines, an initiative led by Canada in the late 90s, and also banned chemical and biological weapons, uh, blinding laser weapons among others. I had the honor, uh, I was a public servant for 29 years, I had the honor of leading the Canadian delegation throughout the 15-month negotiations of the Convention on Cluster Munitions. Within that negotiation, uh, the most contentious issue related to interoperability with non-party states. 
That is to say, our capacity, in our case as a member of NATO, uh, to be able to work, continue to work effectively alongside with countries like the United States that chose not to participate in negotiations. 85% of the countries, at least, uh, were absolutely opposed to any provision for interoperability in the convention for fear that this would provide a legal loophole uh, that would, in some respect, contribute to the continued use of cluster munitions. I, as head of delegation and uh, 21 NATO colleague countries and a few non-NATO uh, countries insisted that we had to have within the convention itself provision for interoperability. But making it very clear at the same time that this in no way would allow our troops to advance the use of cluster munitions. And in fact, we went further and said we will put right in the article itself uh, the fact that we are legally obligated to make best efforts to discourage the use of cluster munitions by any actor any, and under any circumstances. And that is exactly the way, in my view, and the view of uh, 110 other uh, 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 state parties, that that convention uh, or that that article within the convention should be interpreted. Excuse me. No sooner did we return to Canada in 2008, yes, sir, than uh, colleagues at the Department of Foreign, uh, uh, pardon me, the Department of National Defense. Um, insisted on including in Canada's act uh, exceptions that would apply during combined operations with non-party states that in my view and the view of many others are absolutely contrary to the convention itself. Uh, that is exceptions that would allow a Canadian commander of a multinational force to order the use of cluster munitions by non-party states for Canada to transport them on Canadian carriers and in many other substantive ways to aid and abet in the use of cluster munitions. So I would urge this committee to please consider amending <laughs> Section 11 of Canada's Act uh, to absolutely remove all these exceptions that are not consistent with the commitment Canada as a state party has made. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Turcotte. Uh, we now go to uh, Mr. Browder. Uh, Mr. Browder, you have uh, five minutes. We can't hear you, Mr. Browder. Un un unmuted. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for, for this opportunity to uh, discuss the Magnitsky Act in Canada and ways in which we can amend and improve it. As many members of the committee know, um, I was one of the original advocates for the Canadian Magnitsky Act. Uh, Sergei Magnitsky was my lawyer in Russia uh, who was murdered. Um, for uncovering a massive corruption scheme in 2009. Canada passed the Canadian version of the Magnitsky Act in 2017. Um, and now we're in a situation where um, there are 35 countries that have Magnitsky Acts and use them against human rights abusers and kleptocrats around the world. It's been a, um, a remarkable, um, I would say viral, uh, legislative initiative um, that has done a huge amount of good, uh, created uh, a counterbalance to dictators and, and uh, bad actors in the world and something that gives the victims some hope for the future. And so it's, it's, I'm very proud to have been involved in this, but there are things that we can do to improve it. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. And the first thing I want to say is that, as you, as many of you know, um, Canada um, rarely uses the Magnitsky Act. Canada often uses the Special Economic Measures Act um, when when there are human rights abuses. Um, well, of course, it's good that sanction uses whatever it has to punish human rights abusers. But um, part of the uh, of the beauty of the Magnitsky Act is that it is multilateral. In other words, other countries have it. And part of the benefit and part of the objective of the Magnitsky Act is that we have sanctions imposed on bad actors, not just by Canada, but by other countries as well. And so one of the um, problems with uh, the Magnitsky Act in Canada is that, or I should say the Special Economic Measures Act, which is used instead of the Magnitsky Act, is that it causes confusion 
And so to the extent that we want to get other countries to act in unison, which is a very important objective, that gets lost by this mi misnaming of something which is pretty much the same thing. And so I would argue emphatically um, that either the Magnitsky Act should be used, or as I understand, there's some some type of uh, proposal for an amendment to the to the Special Economic Measures Act to call it the Magnitsky Act, so that when when you're sanctioning human rights abusers from Canada, everybody knows that you're using the Magnitsky Act, so that other people who have the Magnitsky Act um, are signaled to use it as well. So my first proposal for an amendment is to either rename the Special Economic Measures Act or use the Magnitsky Act when it comes to human rights abusers, which leads me to the second proposal, which is that harmonization between countries is crucial. We now have a situation where Canada might sanction someone and the UK wouldn't. And, and I'm very aware of a, of a very specific situation um, where that I'm involved in right now, which is uh, a friend of mine and, a, and one of the people who advocated for the Canadian Magnitsky Act, a Russian opposition dissident named Vladimir Karamurza, um, has been uh, put in Russian prison, facing 24 years in prison for calling out Putin's war in Ukraine. Canada, very um, rightly and, and, uh, and, and as a first country, has sanctioned a number of the people involved in his uh, false arrest. And um, uh, unfortunately, um, we're still now working on other countries to do the same thing. And so to the extent that that there can be some type of formal provision in the Canadian Magnitsky Act um, to actively work with other countries um, to harmonize sanctions, it would have a much greater effect. And um, I can absolutely tell you, since I've been to all the countries, that, that um, Canada is not not necessarily talking to the UK and um, perhaps they're talking to the US, but there should be some, something formalized in the law to say that that it's a, the responsibility to try to get other countries um, to do this. Um, the third thing I would propose is that it's confusing for victims of human rights abuse to approach the government and to know how to share evidence um, in order to get people sanctioned. There should be a single point of contact. There should be a widespread um, education of um, how the process works among NGOs and human rights groups and victims groups so that everybody knows how to go about doing this. So that um, there's no mystery. You don't need a law firm. You don't need a specialist that, that anyone can go online, figure out how to present and propose evidence and know how to do it in the best possible way. Um, the final thing I would say is that um, at the moment, there is no responsibility of the government to report back to the parliament about what it's done or what it hasn't done with Magnitsky sanctions. And it's the parliament's job to oversee the government. And the government often doesn't have any good excuse for why they haven't gone forward on Magnitsky sanctions. I've been involved in a number of situations where submissions have been made. And everybody, um, it's like going into a black hole. Everyone, after they make the submissions, nobody knows what's going to happen next. And so I believe that there should be some type of parliamentary review. There should be some type of responsibility for the government to um, say, here's all the submissions that we've gotten, and um, uh, here's the ones we've acted on, so that there's some type of transparency and some type of accountability of the government um, to do this. Uh, it's it's a um, Mr. Browder. I'm afraid tool. you're considerably yeah. over your time limit. Okay. Uh, perhaps Sorry. we will get back to uh, other concerns you have uh, uh, during questions by the uh, members. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so uh, we now go to uh, Ms. Dyfe uh, from Human Rights Watch. Uh, you have uh, five minutes for your opening remarks. And once I hold this uh, up, that means you really should be uh, wrapping it up, please. Ms. Dyfe, uh, the floor is yours for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and honorable members of parliament for inviting me to appear before this committee. My name is Farida Deef and I'm the Canada Director at Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch, as you know, is an independent international human rights organization that monitors human rights abuses in nearly 100 countries, including here in Canada. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share thoughts on Bill C-281. In the nearly seven years that I've been in this role, I've engaged extensively with Global Affairs Canada colleagues, both in Ottawa and at Canadian missions around the world. I've also worked on a range of policy files with relevant staff in the offices of five different foreign ministers appointed during this period. While I've heard more times than I can count that a certain human rights crisis or the case of a prisoner detained in violation of international law was quote unquote top of mind, as civil society were often not privy to much tangible or concrete information in terms of specific actions taken by the government on their behalf. So I certainly welcome the proposed amendment to the Department of Foreign Affairs Trade and Development Act to include reporting requirements relating to international human rights. With enough concrete detail, these annual reports could be a, an incredibly useful tool for Canadian civil society and the human rights sector writ large. These reports could also create a yardstick to measure the implementation of GAC's own voice at risk guidelines on supporting human rights defenders. As noted in the guidelines, Canadian government officials should request to attend trials and visit detainees in prison even when the detaining authority is unlikely to approve the request in order to demonstrate uh, that there's a continued international interest in the case. These guidelines further note attendance by Canadian officials at trials or hearings, a clear and visible expression of Canada's concern can be helpful by allowing for detailed tracking of legal proceedings, observing whether due process is respected, and ensuring up-to-date information on cases of particular interest. Seeking to visit a detainee imprisoned in violation of international human rights law can also be a meaningful way of showing support to the the individual, assessing their treatment and detention, and registering condemnation with the detaining authority. This is why the current amendment on human rights reporting should include detailed information, not only on those prisoners who the government is actively advocating for the release, but also any efforts to attend trials and hearings, the number of requests for prison visits made by Canadian missions and authorities, and the response of the detaining authorities. Of course, in some cases, it would be important to anonymize the names of prisoners to mitigate security risks and possible retaliation. I'd like to turn now to the bill's proposed amendments to the Cluster Munitions Act. Human Rights Watch has played a, reading, a leading role in documenting the harm to civilians caused by cluster munitions, including most recently in the Ukraine conflict. And our research and analysis has informed the negotiation and implementation of the Convention on Cluster Munitions. In 2012, my colleagues in the Arms Division testified before the Senate Foreign Affairs International Trade Committee on then Bill S-10, the Prohibiting Cluster Munitions Act. We also submitted written testimony to the House of Commons Standing Committee, highlighting several key provisions that would benefit from revision or clarification, including the need to explicitly prohibit investment in cluster munitions. As you know, the preamble of the Convention on Cluster Munitions articulates its goal to eliminate cluster munitions and to bring an end to the suffering that they cause. The current bill would advance that objective by reducing funding for the production of cluster munitions. It could also help Canada meet its obligations under Article 9 to take all appropriate legal, administrative, and other measures to implement the Convention. Article 1.1c of the Convention makes it unlawful for state parties to assist anyone with any activity prohibited by the Convention, and investment in cluster munition production is a form of assistance. The funding of entities that develop and produce cluster munitions and their components allows them and encourages them to keep doing so. The amendment proposed in Bill C-281 thus moves Canada one step closer to ensuring that it implements the convention in accordance with the letter and spirit of the law.
in the process, it also provides much needed clarity to financial and other institutions relating to the prohibition on assistance with production of cluster munitions. The amendment is also in line with measures taken by Canada's allies. Since 2007, 11 state parties to the convention have enacted legislation that explicitly prohibits investment in these weapons. Nearly 40 states have stated that they regard investment in cluster munition production as a form of assistance that is prohibited by the convention. It's also important to note that like-minded governments have worked to close any remaining indirect investment loopholes. For example, government pension funds in Australia, France, Ireland, Luxembourg, New Zealand, Norway, and Sweden have either fully or partially withdrawn investments or banned investments in cluster munition producers. We strongly support these efforts to explicitly prohibit investment in the production of cluster munitions. We also support any efforts, as mentioned by, by others, to close remaining loopholes in the existing law that will undercut Canada's ability to fulfill the humanitarian potential of the Convention on Cluster Munitions. Thank you for your attention to these urgent matters and your efforts to advance Canada's leadership on these critical fronts. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Dyfe. Uh, we now go to the members for their questions. Uh, for the first round, uh, you will each get uh, three minutes. Uh, but for the uh, responses, if I do put this up, uh, please uh, wrap up your remarks within uh, 15 seconds. Uh, so we first go to Mr. Chong. You have three minutes, sir. Last weekend, the New York Times had a headline for an article that said, quote, Canada is such an attractive place for money laundering that there's even a special name to describe the activity there, snow washing, end quote. One way sanctions are evaded is through the laundering of money, uh, whether it's uh, money for the proceeds of terrorism uh, or money uh, from the proceeds of uh, corruption. Uh, so my question is for Ms. Deef and Mr. Browder. Um, Mr. Browder, you, you wrote a piece recently with Brandon Silver and Erwin Kotler, uh, that listed, a, a number of recommendations. One of which was that Canada's targeted sanctions must be more effectively enforced. And you referenced glaring loopholes in Canada's sanctions enforcement. Uh, could you elaborate on what those glaring loopholes are? Should I go first? Yes, please. And I, I, I think time is brief, so if you could yeah, yeah. provide so, a brief answer, so, we can also uh, hear from Ms. Deef. Yeah. Um, uh, Canada, uh, from from my perspective, basically doesn't um, have a infrastructure in which to prosecute um, uh high-level financial crimes. Um, we've seen it with our own eyes in relation to the Magnitsky case. We brought um, uh, evidence to the Royal RCMP um, about dirty money from the Magnitsky murder coming to Canada. Um, uh, that information was not acted on properly in spite of law enforcement agencies in many other countries with the same evidence acting on it decisively. And so I think that there is a, uh, a serious lack of capability within the law enforcement agencies. And um, as far as I'm aware, the amount of money frozen in Canada from these um, current Russian sanctions is quite small and um, uh, a lot smaller than, than the amount of money that is in Canada. And so I think that um, Canada uh, needs to step up to the plate, needs to um, uh, get a lot more aggressive in terms of um, uh, both law enforcement and government uh, actions in terms of sanctioning uh, individuals. Thank you. Ms. Deef? Thank you. So I, I mean, we, we don't actively research uh, money laundering issues in Canada, but certainly share many of the concerns that were raised by Mr. Browder earlier around the lack of transparency and accountability in the current um, system in place, sanction system in place in Canada, and the challenges that we face as civil society and others in in formulating submissions uh, to uh, you know relevant officials in order to propose individuals to sanction. There isn't really a clear system to do that, and so that remains an, an outstanding challenge that we hope to rectify. Thank you. Uh, we now go to uh, MP McKay. You have three minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair. And I want to commend Mr. Lawrence for putting this bill forward. Uh, regrettably, there's four subject matters here that are 
uh, would deserve to be a bill by themselves, and it's very difficult to kind of focus. I am going to focus on the um, section with respect to foreign officials, um, and of course, it's delightful to see Mr. Browder again, and I, I appreciate his uh, relentless efforts. I think, however, it would be remiss if I didn't give Mr. Browder a minute to tell us, uh, to give us an update on the health and uh, status of Mr. Vladimir Karamuza. Uh, thank you, Mr. McKay. This is really an important issue. Vladimir Karamurza, as I mentioned, is facing 24 years in prison for standing up to the Putin regime. And um, uh, as many of you will know, he was poisoned twice in 2015 and 2017 by the Russian government, nearly died in both cases. He's now in prison. Um, uh, the effects of the poison um, are uh, have plagued him throughout his time. Um, and he has lost the feeling of his feet um, from the nerve damage that the poison has has, has done. Um, his situation is so extreme that they actually suspended the politically motivated show trial that they put him on, which is very unusual, which uh, shows how concerned the Russians are um, not to have him uh, uh, basically perish in the middle of the trial. And and so this has reached a level of what I would say is extremely urgent um, uh, situation. Uh, the the parliament, uh, uh, I, I understand that there is a, a, a motion in the parliament to make him an honorary Canadian citizen so that the Canadian government can advocate more effectively on his behalf. And I hope that uh, that you and others will support that because this is such a uh, he's a friend of Canada. He's a friend of this. Um, uh, parliament. He's a person who got in, who, who is very effective in doing all the things that we're talking about today and making it all happen. And he deserves our support. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I just, um, uh, it, get, it puts a flesh and blood on what we are actually talking about. And, um, and we all hope that, um, Vladimir is able to rejoin us, but uh, thank you, sir, for your, uh, relentless advocacy. I have a dozen questions <laughs> and I have no time. Um, and I, um, I just want to say that um, it does puzzle me uh, why the, the government prefers to use the uh, SEMA provisions as opposed to Magnitsky sanctions, sanctions. So I found a contact this morning and asked him why, because he's the one that writes the packages and he didn't know. Um, so I think that uh, if this committee does anything, it would be useful to sort out why Magnitsky sanctions are not preferred over SEMA sanctions since the preparation of the package, the presentation to the lawyers, the presentation to the minister, the presentation to the, um, to the cabinet, and the presentation to, uh, and the ultimate order in council are all the same. Um, so I don't know whether you have any insight into that. Mr. Uh, Mr. Browder, but it does puzzle me. Well, I think that this is his. We have, do I have time to answer this? 15 seconds, please. I, I was going to say, I, I think I, I think this is a historic oh, is um, view that was taken by previous governments that didn't want to offend Putin. Putin is very offended by the word Magnitsky um, uh, in the past. Um, different foreign ministries, ministers didn't want to offend Putin when, when we were in this world of, of um, appeasement. We're not in a world of appeasement anymore. No, nobody wants to appease Putin. We should always call it Magnitsky, both because it's the right thing to do. It's the word that it's now a verb pretty much around the world. Um, and it also has the added benefit of upsetting Putin every time he hears the word. Thank you. Uh, we now move to... Uh, Ms. Normandin, we, you have three minutes. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you to all witnesses. My questions are for Mrs. Dave and Mr. Turcotte on uh, cluster, bon cluster um, munitions. We've uh, spoken about uh, monetary issues. There might be a risk that we might criminalize investors who are not aware of the fact that their investments, oftentimes indirect investments, are used uh, for companies that uh, create um, 
cluster munitions, it was said that we might have to have a section of uh, knowledge of this as such as what New Zealand did, would this be a way to avoid penalizing people who are not aware or on the contrary, would this already be covered by the act or would it another possibility to have an add on in order to um, uh, to avoid the act to say, oh, well, I don't I don't know. And, and then uh, it's a it's a kind of a loophole. able to watch uh, a videotape of uh, previous discussions that this committee has had on that very issue. And I have to say, I agree completely that intent is germane uh, to, to the actions that are taken indirectly. And in my view, uh, I am sure uh, colleagues at, or former colleagues at the uh, Department of Justice can provide language uh, in any amendment that would make it very clear that if Canadians, through no fault of their own, no willful negligence in this case, um, uh, indirectly invest in, in cluster munitions that they will not be held accountable while at the same time holding those, uh, those institutions and individuals accountable uh, who are very much aware of their actions. Madame Dave. Mrs. Dave. Thank you very much for the question. I mean, our position has always been the same from the time that we testified um, around the, the cluster munitions bill to today, when it was being drafted, you know, nine years ago now. Um, our belief is that Canada should ensure that there is a clear prohibition, a categoric prohibition on assistance, foreign stockpiling, transit and investment um, of cluster munitions. How that becomes operationalized, how to ensure that individuals who are potentially kind of inadvertently um, investing, um, how those types of issues should be mitigated, that I leave up to uh, members of this committee. But certainly that's our position is very clear in terms of ensuring that Canada um, removes any obstacles that are in the way of achieving the convention, the cluster munition convention's goals, or are running counter to the goals of the convention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Deef. Uh, we now uh, move to... Uh, uh, Ms. Matheson. Ms. Matheson, uh, you have uh, three minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Uh, so the um, I want to thank uh, you, Mr. Turcotte, and, and I'll and I'll put my first question to you. Uh, we absolutely the NDP absolutely agrees in terms of that elimination of Section 11, and we will be putting forward uh, an amendment at this committee to do so for that elimination. Um, could you talk though? You were very very clear about this, but could you talk about the consequences of, of if um, that elimination of Section 11 wasn't accomplished? Well, uh, yes. Thank you very much for that question. Um, the, the main consequence would be that Canada would finally be compliant with the convention itself and its, its obligations. Uh, uh, the, the second uh, result would be that we would be consistent with the position that has been taken by 110 other state parties to the convention. So it would be extremely positive. Now, in terms of effectiveness in combined operations with non-party states, I firmly believe that at the time, this is 15 years ago, that colleagues from the Department of National Defense believed that not having these exceptions would somehow compromise Canada's effectiveness. Uh, we have 15 years of hindsight and we have seen what legislation has been passed by our NATO allies and, uh, and, and uh, others uh, who are like-minded. And the fact that not one of them has included in their legislation um, such provisions and certainly uh, other countries such as the United Kingdom, France, Germany and others have the same level of concern about interoperability as we do uh, and it has not compromised their effectiveness uh, nor uh, do I think in any in any real sense has it compromised uh, uh, Canada. So that is to say, I don't believe that those exceptions have in any way uh, enabled Canada to play a more effective role in combined operations than if they had not been there. Um, Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Ms. Steve, uh, could you uh, elaborate if, uh, if you have anything to elaborate actually on that same question? 
mean, certainly we would agree that that, that amendment uh, to Section 11 is, is necessary. This is something that we've been calling on um, Canada to do since the, the very beginning. Um, and, you know, those are sort of, they remain key concerns for us. Issues around investment. I mean, I think we're pleased that one loophole, which is the issue around investment in cluster munitions, is going to be addressed by the current amendment to bill uh, in Bill C-281. But at the same time, there are other loopholes, which include Section 11, that should be addressed. Um, uh, Mr. Turcotte, um, sorry? remaining so if we could have a oh shoot response. okay <laughs> it goes fast um so in previous testimony government witnesses talked about the fact that canada would never condone the use of of those cluster munitions and yet they they don't push for that elimination in section 11. why do you think that is could you comment on that well um uh, yes we, we actually <laughs> we actually are trying to have it both ways on one hand we say we we, we claim that our country is a state party in good standing, fully compliant with the convention, and yet we continue to have in the act uh, a list of exceptions. As I say, it goes beyond aiding and abetting, and there is a, a, a section of, of, of that wider section that actually enables the Canadian commander of a multinational force to order, to authorize or direct the use of cluster munitions by non-party state forces, not by Canadians, by others. In this case, we are the author of the order uh, and and non-party states become our agents, uh, and that is in no way consistent with what we negotiated in uh, uh, in a 15-month period uh, 15 years ago now. Thank you, Mr. Turcott. Uh, we now go to Mr. Jenis. You have two minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms. Deef, well, the conclusion I'm drawing from some of the back and forth about the uh, the section on prisoners of conscience is that. Um, it's not good enough for the government to just say, just trust us. There should be some mechanisms of pressure and accountability around the listing of, of those individuals, accountability to parliamentarians, to civil society, and to the wider public. But at the same time, there does need to be some margin for flexibility. Uh, there may be legitimate cases where, uh, based on the wishes of the person involved, their family, their advocates, and, and their own assessment of their interests, uh, publication of their name doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, so I, th I think what we have to do in the amending process is come up with some procedure that, that does involve pressure on the government, that does involve publication of names, bring, in, in, in many cases bringing more, more sunlight to this, more accountability, but also some measure of, of flexibility. Um, would you agree with that assessment and do you think it would be useful to publish some names while having others anonymized based on the wishes of the families or a, or a sincere calculation of the interests of the people involved? Yes, I mean, I, I agree that I think a hybrid type of um, solution makes the most sense to include some names where family members have agreed to it, those individuals are perhaps very public already in the public sphere, while including the number of others that are that are being advocated for. So, for example, um, it would be interesting to say in China, the Minister of Foreign Affairs is actively advocating um, uh, for the release of these three said individuals, as well as six other detainees who are, you know, who remain anonymous. But having that type of uh, of information and content is really important for us. We have none of that at the moment. We have the voices um, at risk guidelines, but we have no real sense of, of when um, Canadian missions and officials overseas are actually meeting with prisoners, are requesting to, to you know, monitor trials. None of that data currently exists. And so that's the type of information that we need. Thank you, Ms. Um, so we now go to uh, MP Sorbera. You have two minutes. Thank, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you to all the witnesses for your testimony. Um, I'd like to go to Mr. Browder. Mr. Browder, I've personally followed uh, much of what you've done over the years, and I want to thank you for that. I'm not a, a permanent permanent member of this uh, committee, uh, and I do feel it's quite uh, quite a privilege to, to ask you a question. In your opening uh, comments, uh, you talked about why harmonization uh, is so important between uh, uh, countries. Uh, can you elaborate on on that uh, aspect of, of everything you've worked on and why it's so important that countries cooperate and collaborate on, on this initiative? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much and good good to meet you here. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's uh, I'll just use a real life example of in the Magnitsky case. So Sergei Magnitsky was murdered 
um, uh, for uncovering a, a $230 million corruption scheme. Um, the people who stole that money um, and killed him uh, have, keep that money in the West. And we wanted to shut down the West for them so they couldn't use their bank accounts and they couldn't travel. And we succeeded um, in the United States, in Canada, um, in the UK and Australia. Um, but uh, for some reason, because of the European Union's an unanimity uh, requirement, um, uh, Hungary objected. And so nobody was sanctioned in the European Union. So um, although the sanctions have been quite effective and punishing on the individuals, they could still freely travel in and out of uh, in and out of the European Union. And, and um, that that upsets me and it upsets Sergei's family and it's not right. And um, and there's many other similar situations where um, in in all of these uh, sanctions regimes where they're sanctioned by one country or two countries or three countries, but not by all the countries. And so um, to be effective, you have to basically close off the world to human rights abusers and kleptocrats. And to close off the world, everybody has to do it. And and so um, this is this is probably one of the most important parts of the Magnitsky regime is to. Um, create a situation where we do close off the world. And so I do hope that that this becomes um, a, a priority and a target and something which um, Canada takes seriously. And of course, I'm working and saying the same thing to other governments. And so when I come here and I talk to you, I'm also saying the same thing to the British, to the United States, um, to the European Union. And it's it's hard to to get everybody to work together, but I think this is this is something that's of of very, very, very high importance. to uh, uh, Madame Normanda, you have one minute remaining. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. My question is for Mr. Browder. You spoke of the importance uh, for countries uh, to uh, harmonize together for the Magnitsky, but with this act, the committee could publicly talk about the application of a sanction and make a recommendation to the Department of Foreign Affairs. Do you think that this uh, could um, uh, stop uh, harmonization with other countries, or do you think it could happen at the same time? That is to say that government could work on harmonization and the committee could work on the selection of individuals for, for application of this. Well, so so I think that, that it, it's very important for, for, for both things to happen. I think the parliament is very, very important, and this committee is very, very important in, in keeping the government's, holding the government's feet to the fire. And, and once the government's feet have been held to the fire, when, when the government has made a, a, a conscious, proactive decision to do something, then it's um, very much um, incumbent on them to call up the, 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 the counterparts in the United States and the UK and the European Union and say that we have evidence. This evidence has been presented by our parliament or by human rights activists. And um, uh, we're going to sanction these people and we'd like you to do it as well. And I think that um, uh, in 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 having both things happen, it's it's only good. There's no there's no downside, and um, and you know really is there there should be nobody to argue against this idea. And I'm sure uh, other than people who just don't want to do more work uh, in the um, global affairs Canada by calling up their counterparts. I think this has to be formalized. Thank you for the uh, final question. We go to uh, Ms. Matheson. You get a minute. Uh, take it away, please. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Steve, I'd like to uh, ask you, so uh, the NDP will uh, introduce uh, an amendment requiring the government to develop an international human rights strategy, uh, which would then uh, allow for an annual report to, to be addressed by it. Um, do you agree that such a strategy is necessary? And could you tell us a, a bit why you would uh, agree with that? Yeah, no, I mean, a strategy is critical. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, we've had five different foreign ministers in the past seven years that I've been in this role, that's significant transition, having, you know, an overarching strategy, a multi year strategy would mean that there would be some continuity on on key human rights files, we wouldn't be reinventing the wheel um, with every transition. So certainly critical to have a human rights strategy for that reason. And also, um, in order to create a sort of yardstick, a benchmark um, to assess the, you know, minister uh, actions and activities uh, with respect to human rights. So that I think will be will be very critical.
And just to, if I can make a final point, if I if I have the time, um, in terms of I know there's been a conversation around prisoners of conscience and kind of the framing of the language um, around the human rights reporting. I I agree with Alex Neve in terms of the language being um, you know uh, prisoners who are detained in violation of international law. I think that's a much broader definition that would also um, you know capture. The two Michaels who were detained in China, for example, Canadian, Iranian dual nationals and others who are detained on trumped up, you know, espionage, uh, uh, terrorism, treason charges who are not necessarily prisoners of conscience. They may just be ordinary engineers, doctors, et cetera, who are dual nationals and are then detained. And so a kind of larger over encompassing definition, I think, would be um, much more effective. Thank you. And that uh, concludes uh, this session. Uh, allow me to thank uh, Mr. Turcott, who is here in person, uh, as well as Mr. Browder and uh, Ms. Deef. Uh, we're very, very grateful for your time uh, and your testimony and our apologies uh, that this particular session was truncated uh, just because we had some uh, votes in the House. So uh, on that note, let me thank you again. Uh, and looking forward to uh, perhaps uh, having you back uh, at committee very soon. Thank you. And uh, for the members, just wanted to say uh, Tuesday, April 18th, when we get back, the first session, uh, we are having clause by clause consideration of Bill C-281 and, um, and was wondering whether it's the will of the committee to adjourn.